Let's begin by talking about what was happening in the field uh, during the time that you were president. It's a fascinating time to be involved with ASRA. We had just switched management companies from Ruggles to the American Society of Anesthesiologists. Um, the society had gone through a difficult transition period and was on the upswing. And so we were starting to have growth in numbers back at the meetings. We were starting to become a more financially viable organization. Um, spinal cord stimulation was gaining tremendous momentum. And so we had developed fellowship support with Boston Scientific at the, at the time and had been able to give out awards at the annual meetings. We were introducing the first cadaver-based fellowship training programs with companies for the fellows at the meetings. And it was an exciting time. The organization had seen a decline in overall membership. And one of the things that we wanted to do was try to increase involvement and get the residents committed who would then become members of the organization. So we put a huge amount of time and effort into growing the residents section to assigning good people to help lead it, like yourself, <laughs> and to watch the residents get involved in the meeting and actually to carve out time for the residents to have a meeting that was specially dedicated to them and to address some of the issues that they were interested in. They also got separate workshops and they had an opportunity to begin to interact with the faculty and develop relationships that I think have continued over the years. And we've seen many who were involved in the as a resident section go on to become actively engaged in the organization itself. I go back and I think about some of the most memorable things that happened when I was on the board of directors. Um, I couched my activities and my thoughts about ASRA in light of the meeting that occurred in Williamsburg. And ASRA had had several disastrous meetings, had lost money on the meetings, had lost money as an organization. Mike Ferrante was the treasurer. Mike Mulroy was the president at the time. And we went through and looked at the budgeting process for ASRA and said, we have to change things dramatically. And so we sat and made draconian cuts in what the speakers got, how much we gave to travel, what we did with the meetings. And we said, if we don't make these significant changes, the organization itself is not going to survive. And as a result of those actions and the commitment on the part of the board to make a difference for the future, we emerged out of that transition process that Terry Horlocker had helped lead to transition from Ruggles to the ASA in a way that allowed us to markedly improve our financial strength and to begin to do far more things for the members overall and to improve the size and the quality of the meetings. Mm -hmm. um, I look back at my presidency and I think of it as an absolutely wonderful time of my life. Um, to be able to take ideas that you had in your head and bring them to life and to watch the response. We have always viewed ASRA as a very family-oriented organization. And so one of the things that I did during presidency was saying, the president's reception, which we had eliminated altogether, needs to come back. And so I made a big effort to put on, in a sense, good parties, mm -hmm. but something that would allow the the people who had come to the meeting to feel like they got to interact with everybody. They got to develop friendships that were outside of just, I attended this meeting. So that they felt like they belonged to ASRA. And some of the fun things, we were able to introduce Admiral Hadzik Band <laughs> into the performances at the regional, regional anesthesia meetings. And I remember the Second meeting we did was at the Rancho Mirage mm -hmm. in California. And on the Friday night, we rented out the blue guitar. <laughs> and people were instructed to actually bring their instruments or bring their talent. And so we saw ASRA members get up and play with ASMR's band, play organ, play guitar. Mm -hmm. We saw people like Brian Williams get up <laughs> and sing Comfortably Numb <laughs> from Pink Floyd to the accompaniment of a blues band. Right? But it was a unique experience, and many, many people talked about doing those things together. And then the subsequent year when we did it in Vancouver, and we were the first time broke a 1,000 mm -hmm. at a spring annual meeting again, 
and we had Az Ad Admir's band playing again, and it was really a great deal of fun. And I think many people felt like they belonged to the organization and that it was not only a scientific and academic organization, but an organization that they could develop friendships in and feel a part of mm -hmm. overall. If you had just three words um, to describe ASRA and how you feel about ASRA, what would those three words be? I would say that ASRA is ethical and works hard to provide a real answer to the scientific answers that are out there or the information that we have. Um, leading in the sense that it's created documents that have guided many, many anesthesiologists practice. When you look at the anticoagulation guidelines, when you look at the infection guidelines, ASRA has led in this space in a way that no other anesthesiology organization has. Um, and the third thing I would say is it has been an organization that has been accessible. Um, so I remember when I first came to my meeting in 1988 um, as a fellow, and subsequently over the years, I've always felt like I, the leadership of ASRA was accessible to the members whether you caught them in the hall, whether you called them on the phone, whether you emailed them, they've been accessible. And that, that accessibility has allowed many, many people to translate their enjoyment of a particular subspecialty of regional anesthesia or pain medicine into something that becomes a long, lifelong career. Mm -hmm. And so I'd say those three things are really the way that I think about ASRA. We hear over and over again, if there's no margin, there's no mission, okay? But we have to be careful that margin doesn't become the mission so that we give up the things that brought us to where we are right now and take us in the future. The other thing that I think that is really fun as I look at the meeting this year and look back over time is that we watched this transition from anatomic blocks alone to anatomic blocks with paresthesia to anatomic blocks with nerve stimulation to ultrasound, we don't need any of that stinking <laughs> nerve stimulation stuff anymore. We have, to, but we have to block every single individual nerve. To at this year's meeting, we're once again talking about fascial sheaths, mm -hmm. a la Alan Winnie in the 1960s. <laughs> and so we've gone back to the future, mm -hmm. and things that we believed early on have come back mm -hmm. in the reality of what anatomy is. So as we think about how the human body is put together and how we practice and how we think about doing these things that are gonna provide pain relief to our patients or anesthesia to our patients, we're still led by the real anatomy, not what we fantasize it to be. EASRA has been an organization that uh, has been very important to me personally and as a professional. So I think the time that I've spent with EASRA, the many volunteer hours that I've put in with EASRA, have borne many, many fruits. And I think back on you know, so many people who have become dear, dear friends over the years and people whose mentoring relationships have impacted my entire career. I think mm -hmm. I got started with ASRA because of Brendan Finucane, <laughs> okay? Um, I kept doing things, the other person probably in ASRA that had a big impact on me was Dave Brown. Mm -hmm. um, and I go back and I think about things that I did that were different. So I've been willing to push the envelope to begin with. So I was a program chair for the 1999 meeting in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And at that point in time, a gentleman who's become actively engaged with ASRA now was a resident by the name of Ban Sui, right? <laughs> yeah. Ban Sui was talking about using electrical stimulation as a means of confirming epidural placement, specifically in children. Right? He was a resident, right? <laughs> but he was the only person in the world who was talking about this technique, had published about this technique. And so I pushed back against the board mm -hmm. and we invited Ban to be a faculty member <laughs> as a resident in the 1999 meeting. Wow. And he subsequently went on to become a prolific publisher, <laughs> researcher, um, clinician, scientist, and is absolutely spectacular and is in, actively engaged in the meetings. <laughs> but he's the first and only resident faculty member during an ASRA meeting that I am aware of. As you get, you know, focused in on doing a procedure or thinking about, you know, whether or not it's this drug or that drug or the other thing, is not forgetting about what a privilege we have to be physicians, 
to practice medicine, to take care of patients, and to care about their outcomes. You know, and that the decisions we make should be driven by a good foundation in ethical medicine. Mm -hmm. um, you're not doing something just to make more money or just because you like to do it, but actually thinking about how do you take care of that patient? How do you get the best possible outcome? Am I really qualified to do the thing that I'm about to do on this patient? Um, and if I'm not, do I have the you know, integrity to say, you know what, I'm not doing this, right? I'm gonna go get that young guy who trained in how to do this and has actually more experience than I do and say, help me get this done for this patient so that the outcome is what we want it to be, not just I did this thing or my ego is so big that I'm doing this for myself instead of the patient.